Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipper, the club's vice president of media and editorial and Michelle's co-host for this program. Thanks for joining us today. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Commonwealth Club is a 118-year-old nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to the civil discussion of important issues of the day. Any opinions expressed are those of the speakers. Now, the Commonwealth Club is producing hundreds of programs a year, even during the pandemic. So head over to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS for future program listings, as well as audio and uh, video of past events. Today's program is part of our Good Lit series underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. And if you're watching us live on YouTube, use the chat box to submit questions for our special guest today. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle Miao, the producer and host of The Michelle Miao Show and a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. Good to see you this morning, Michelle. Thank you so much, John, and thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Our guest today is Jay Caspian Kang, who is writer at large for the New York Times Magazine. He's also author of his latest book, The Loneliest Americans, in which we'll have a discussion on today. Jay, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. So um, I know you've been asked this already which is about the title, but I feel special to ask this question so that we can have, you know, a lengthy conversation about it. I mean, I'm so drawn to it. I never knew that I myself felt lonely as an Asian, as an Asian American, and uh, also throw in queer, um, you know, when it comes to even describing myself as a lonely American. Tell us about, you know, the title and kind of how it all came to be and why you chose that. Right. Um, the idea is about uh, a place that, people can be political, right? It's about the political situation of people in this country. And so, um, you know, I think back quite a bit to the Kambahi River Collective, right? Which is sort of supposed to be like the birthplace of identity politics, Barbara Smith and some other thinkers. And, they, um, and the idea was, uh, is there a place for black queer women to enter politics? Because, um, you know, the sort of black movement seemed to, to exclude them in some ways because they were women and the women's movement exclude them because they were black. Right. And so, uh, there was this idea. Um, I'm sorry. Yep. There, there was this greater idea at that point, whether or not, uh, one should try and enter politics through, you know, being, being black and queer. And so, um, I think that I thought about that quite a bit while writing the book, right? It was, uh, where, where is there a place for, is there a place where Asian Americans can enter politics, right? And, and is the term too broad to even use that term as a way to enter politics, right? Like it, does the term mean anything? Like, does it, is, is like, if I go to my parents who are Korean immigrants and I say, are you involved in politics? They would say yes, right? Cause they're Bernie Sanders supporters. Did you reach this because of Asian Americanness? And they would say, what's Asian Americanness? <laughs> you know, like we don't know what that term means. We're like Korean immigrants and we like Bernie Sanders because, you know, that's the sort of class politics that they're interested in. And so I, I thought about this quite a bit. And it's just like, well, I think that in certain places, you know, in particular the Bay Area here, right? There is a history of Asian American politics, right? Um, but for the vast majority of the country and the vast majority of Asian Americans, I don't think that that term is actually accessed into politics, right? And so then you feel certain alienation by this sort of two-way street, right? The first part says you are this group and this group is you. And then yet you don't feel too much affiliation with that group, right? You don't know what it means politically. And I think that does lead to a certain type of political loneliness, right? And so the, the, the title of the book is, is meant to be a statement about political situation, um, not so much like an existential, like nobody likes me type of thing, because there are lonely people of all types, you know, <laughs> and certainly there are a lot of Asian people who are not lonely at all, you know? So um, I, that, that was sort of the idea behind it. You uh, know in the book, of course, certain of the moment things that are happening as you're preparing this book and as you're writing it, you know, the, the Asian attacks, anti-Asian attacks, the, the pandemic, and of course, the, the national politics. Um, did the ongoing national and, and local conversations about racial reckoning and things, do you think that helps the kind of set the table for your audience to understand your argument or does it distract? Because you kind of go in some directions that I think a lot of folks today would right. be surprised at. You know, they might be go to the book thinking it's going to kind of be going into one thing very specifically about Asian American identity. And really you, you're, you kind of take them in a different direction. 
Um, I don't like the question of whether or not it helped or hurt. It did make it more complicated. You know, like I started writing this book before the pandemic and, you know, I had a certain idea of stuff and that did of course change quite a bit. Right. Um, and, uh, I don't know if it ended up being a positive or a negative, but certainly it better reflects the reality we're in today that I actually had to go back and make sure that I was right about things. So, um, and I think it did actually accentuate it for, by the very simple fact that I live here, you know, like where that seemed to be the real epicenter of, of the concern about the attacks, whether it was the, uh, 92 year old man. in in um, I think it was like uh, somewhere in San Francisco, right? Yeah. Like I think West portal or something like that, or in Oakland, uh, uh, in the Marina. Okay. In the Marina and, uh, in Oakland, like a, you know, like an old man was shoved and killed in Oakland, like a couple days later. Um, and then there were these incidents that were caught on camera. Right. And it seemed to all circulate here in the Bay area. And so, and then you see things on social media, you see things where people are talking, and that they don't really resemble things that they would that you would hear before, right? Like there's an anger, um, and there is an attempt, I think, to sort of turn this identity into something in that moment, right? And you see it in the hashtags that were created, like stop, you know, like stop AAPI hate. It's just like, you know, part of me is like that's great, and then the other part of me is like, what's an AAPI? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like what, like how do we how do we sort of conceptualize this in this moment? And why are we banding together? Why is the politics only about, uh, is it really about AAPI, right? Like, are we talking about South Asian people when we stop, when we talk about this, are we talking about Pacific Islanders? We're talking about this, or are we just talking about East Asian people who might be mistaken for Chinese people, right? Or, or are Chinese people? And those are all questions that I tried to bring into the book, right? Cause I think it sort of explode it. It expanded the contradictions that I'm interested in, in the book, uh, a little bit more. Well, let's um, talk about AAPI or Asian American and uh, as an identity. I mean, you break it down as far as your perspective on um, whether it's efficient or not in, in, in our movement at, today, right? Like when right. we're talking about some of the political issues that we face, uh, you know, for me all my life, I mean, I'm, I'm hitting 40 next year, but I had always assumed that I am Asian American because I was born in America. I have to check off a box when I fill out the census that asks if I'm Asian and, you know, and all this stuff. And so um, I hadn't really thought about it in this provocative way that you bring up. Explain to us, you know, kind of how you see it as being inefficient when we're having political conversations. Um, Well, I, you know, I think that that when people it just depends what situation you're in. Right. But I think it, that there's a lot of it, which where you really do have to try and wonder, like, who are we really talking about here? Right. Like, who are the people who are part of this, like, coalition and who are the people who are not? And so from my perspective, it's like I generally think that basically the identity, what when when people talk about this identity broadly, especially in the mainstream media, what they're talking about is sort of the upwardly ascendant class of East Asian Americans, right? Of which I am one of. You know, like I I was, you know, like I'm Korean American and uh, you know, I don't know, I write for the New York Times and I went to good colleges. My parents are fine financially now, and I am also fine financially, right? And that um a lot of the questions around it turn out to be about people like me, right? And I would say that that is understandable because we are the types of people who go into media, we're the types of people who occupy jobs and have interactions with people who are in power. Now, the flip side of that is that like what you're not talking about are, you know, it, it, I, I'm very glad this is in the Bay Area because I can use like local examples, but you know, like our, when you say like stop AAPI hate, right? When you say like, this is the, this is like the, moment for Asian Americans. Like, are you talking about the Lao, like the Laotian com- uh, community in, in East Oakland? Right. I don't think so. You know, are you talking about uh, the, the, the Hmong communities, right. In, in uh, up North, like in, in Wairika or, or like sort of up North in, in the Humboldt County. I don't think so. Right. Like those, those that, and yet those people also have to sort of wear this term Asian American. And so the, the argument that I try and make is that like, if a politics is around a group of upwardly ascendant people, right, then then it will be sort of by definition a and if you think about it in any terms of class analysis, right, it'll just be about the it'll just be about kind of like a upper middle, you know, like a middle class type of politics. And that that in itself is not really something that I think is 
particularly great for, you know, trying to establish solidarity. It's not great for sort of garnishing a ton of support for, and it's also very difficult to try and, uh, I think it's difficult to parse, especially when the people who are making those arguments are also insisting that this is a revolutionary politics in some sort of way. And I think we can just say it's not, you know, um, now there's nothing wrong with it, but, um, we should at least call it for what it is. Right. And so a lot of the book is just an attempt to just be like, this is what it is. Right. <laughs> it it kind of sounds like an echo of, uh, some of what we was reading back in the 1980s, right. uh, before your times, um, when, uh, journalists, especially, you know, on the, on the big national stage, there were a number of journalists who were becoming fabulously wealthy with their TV contracts and their writing and their, all that kind of stuff. And, and people were making the point of, um, you know, you, Hey, you journalist X, Y, Z, uh, you know, you're kind of famous for being a, a, a left-wing journalist. And yet, can you really have any connection and really understand someone who's maybe struggling to come up with $200 to pay their rent when you're struggling to, uh, come up with another $2 million to buy some more property in Manhattan right. or something like that. Right. Um, and, and, you know, maybe we're getting the flip side of that today where journalism is kind of disintegrating and they're coming back to being poor, <laughs> right. but uh, it has. So, and you kind of touched on this at the end and I'm not sure if you wanted to go into that angle of it, but is the focus on race a distraction from the class issues or, <laughs> Can yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's one that I, I look, I have two thoughts about this. The first is that I, you know, like I generally tr try and think about things more in terms of class than race. Right. But I also am not a class reductionist in the sense that I think that like everybody should just forget about their identity and the thoughts that they have. I, it, I think in Asian America, it's even more ridiculous because like, I think that, you know, like you have recent immigrants who don't speak English, they speak Chinese or they speak whatever language that they have to go in them just be like, Hey, you know, you should forget entirely about your ethnic identity. It's great. They're not going to do it. Right. It's impossible. Like you have to meet people where they are. But I think at the same time, when you're trying to think about these things more broadly, that you should try and think about the actual class distinctions within these, within groups of people. Right. And I think that not doing so really does sort of cloud a lot of issues. Right. Like, and I do think that in some ways it can be like what you call the distraction, because I think that what happens is that, you know, the example that I use in the book and one that I think is very true is that after six women get massacred, uh, in, um, in Georgia. Right. And these are women who are, who are, you know, live extremely precarious lives. Right. Um, many of them are working and are working as sex workers. Like I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with working as a sex worker, but it is a precarious life that they are living. Right. Like they are not, they are not wealthy people and they are people who have, uh, radically different lives than the people who sort of comment on this stuff in the media. You know, it took about five days for that issue to turn into in the mainstream media, a sort of referendum on, corporate microaggressions in the workplace that Asian Americans face, right? Or, or it's sort of narratives about like, hey, you know, like I feel bad about having to anglicize my name, right? Like, um, and I think that that type of politics is actually catastrophic, right? Like, and I think that that does lead, the, the, the idea, the reason why that happens is because I as an Asian American and I'm trying to identify with another person who is tagged as Asian American. And yet I make no effort to try and understand the particulars of their life. Right. And so then my experience becomes sort of like a cocooning influence on their, on their lives. And by doing that, we've stripped out every single thing that, that put them in such a precarious place. Right. Um, and that I think that I, I do think that that process is destructive and, you know, like I try and speak out about it as much as possible. It's not the most popular position, you know, but, um, um, but, you know, I, I, I think it's almost undeniably true. And I think it's something that most uh, I think it's something that most that most Asian Americans actually I think they agree, you know, like they understand it. It's just very difficult to try and figure out, well, how do you you know, how do you drop this? Right. And that's that's sort of the contradiction that is at the at the center of the book in a lot of ways. The book goes in between lots of historical data and also your own personal experiences, which I, I enjoy. I enjoyed reading that. But, you know, speaking of the historical data, there's a lot of there that I learned even myself. And I find like in today's time, a lot of people have either forgotten um, some of the, the history, the racist history in the United States. And uh, some people actually don't even know, like, for example, you bring up you know, especially if you're second, third, fourth, fifth generation here in America, 
And so I wanted to ask, you know, what um, your perspective is, if, is it, is it that you need to learn this stuff, you know, all the time, like, especially if you're new incoming, you know, immigrants, you have to learn this stuff, or is it more important that uh, people here in the United States need to be much more culturally competent and, or, uh, you know, immigrants then need to do uh, more assimilating. I don't know. It's kind of a jumble of questions <laughs> there, but, right. but um, yeah, I, you know, and just, just to talk a little bit about that. Cause I kind of feel like the, the your personal experiences and the historical data uh, weighed equally when it came to learning what you were trying to say. Right. Um, I think that there's two answers to that. And, you know, like uh, the first is that I think that there is a population of Asian Americans in this country that is very small, right. Who lived a different life than the majority of Asian Americans in this country. And, um, you know, I write a chapter in the book about the third world liberation front and the Asian American political Alliance at Cal. Right. And that, um, you know, a lot of that came from people who are like fourth, fifth generation Asian Americans in the 1960s, right? So their families have been here, some of them since the ninth, uh, turn of the 20th century. And that those people had experienced a type of racism in America that that was, you know, that made them understand what this country is, right? Some of them had been interned, right? Uh, some of them had direct relatives who had been lynched or, or run out of, you know, run out of towns or, or whatever amounts of violence that were happening, their existence in this country was very peculiar because, you know, there was the exclusion act, right? Like nobody else could come over. So you're just by yourself. You're not like, Hey, I want my uh, extended family to come over to the United States. Cause they couldn't. Right. So that is a, that those people, created radical politics in the late sixties, right? At, at San Francisco state, they created at, um, at, at Cal and then it spreads. Uh, the majority, vast majority of Asian Americans are people who came post 1965 immigration act, right? So they're people who sort of come, a lot of them come on skilled worker visas. A lot of them come through chain migration, but they have very little connection to that history, right? Like they sort of, their world America starts in 1965, um, or 1971, 1975, whatever year that they immigrated. And so they don't really have, they don't really see the connections to the past in that sort of way. And I think that's a very important distinction to make. Now, I'm not saying that they're right to not see those connections. I'm just stating the fact that they don't see those connections, right? Like, so if I asked my, I don't want to keep bringing my parents into it, but you know, like if I asked my parents or my aunts and uncles, like, do you know who Vincent Chin is? Like, you know, they were in America when Vincent, when the Vincent Chin protest happened, every single one of them actually was living in America in the eighties and none of them would know what that was. You know, um, if I asked them more specifically, like, do you, do you know anything about third world liberation front or, you know, like, or these things, they'd be like, what, like, what are you talking about? Right. And so there is not this knowledge of, of history because I think there's such a direct disconnect between those two groups. And that's something, I don't know, the vast, vast majority of people are post 1965. And so I think that it's important to learn these histories, right. I think that uh, that those, but we should be very realistic about how much people will actually feel connected to those histories, right? Um, now, that's very different than groups in America, where you know every single one of your great aunts and great uncles was living under Jim Crow, right? Um, where the, where your where your mother was attending a segregated school, right? Like that's that that it, it's very different, and I think that um, there needs to be some acknowledgement of that difference before we start like sort of making history into the only answer. Right. And that um, I think the other thing that that does is that it sort of obscures the problems of today. Right. Like, um, I think that when you just say, well, we should think about the Chinese Exclusion Act. Right. Um, I think it's a way to sort of do a shorthand. Right. Uh, and that I don't think it's particularly effective. Uh, but I do think that for people's sense of why they're in America, their sense of what America can do to people like them. I think it's very important to learn that history, you know? So at the same time, I, I just think that we need to sort of teach it in a way that acknowledges that 1965 radically changed the, the country and that most of the people uh, who came post 1965 have a different stake in, in that history of oppression. You've joked that for much of what you've written, your audience is lawyers on planes. Uh, <laughs> talk a bit about who you see your audience for this book and, and what, you know, are these, do you think you're, you're preaching to the choir on some of this or do you oh, think you're, you're convincing? Right. I don't, um, 
I made that comment because I work for the times and you know, like they always say, uh, they don't always say, but sometimes they say like picture times reader, you know? And so in my head, I just picture this like lawyer on He's like in his mid fifties, he's on a plane, uh, from let's say like New York to like Houston or something for some sort of work thing. And he has like two hours and he just reads the magazine, you know? And so like that, that's sort of, uh, that's sort of what, my head always goes to, and, you know, sometimes it's restrictive, sometimes it's not restrictive, but it's always fine. Um, this book is very different than that. You know, like I wanted to sort of have an argument with, uh, sort of Asian American establishment here, you know, like I wanted to say the ways in which we talk about these things are not working, right? Like they're not building solidarity with other groups, even though we say, you know, we pretend they are like, where is the proof of that solidarity? Um, we have forgotten about poor immigrant people, right? Like we have forgotten about those people. And we say that we, that that is the center of our activism, but I don't see it, right? What I see is a whole bunch of people mad about Hollywood representation and Scarlett Johansson in whatever movie. And like that, that is, we have to admit that that is a core of our politics, right? And we, then we have to assess whether or not we want those politics at all. Now, my argument has always been that we shouldn't want those politics, right? Like who really cares? It's just Hollywood. It's a movie, right? It doesn't really matter. Like there, there's all sorts of bigger problems out there. Um, and so that, that sort of, that my idea was to try and provoke a fight, you know, with the book and the intended audience is not just Asian Americans. You know, those are the, I think that there's certain class of Asian Americans who's going to get the maddest at me and they have certainly done that. Right. But I wanted the parallels of this type of structure, this type of class structure that immigrant that forms in almost every single immigrant community, right? To feel universal amongst those immigrant communities. And so it is a, you know, like in the end, the book is just sort of a call to, to immigrant solidarity more than anything else. Right. And some of the best conversations that I've had about the book are with, you know, Latino people, with readers who, who are, who are Jewish, you know, and people who sort of have similar, whatever generation it came in, they have a similar I understanding of immigration and assimilation. And, and I want the book to feel universal in that sort of way. But yeah, it's, it's definitely not for like lawyers on a plane to enjoy a flight, right? Like, <laughs> kind of want, like it's more of like a, Hey, you know, it's, it's a little more of a poke than that. Well, you certainly, I, I enjoyed it because you truly did make me think you made me think a whole lot. We've done a lot of interviews in the past year and a half, John and I, uh, around, you know, the discussions of racial inequity, um, and especially in the AAPI community. I want to read a little bit from your book. And this is from the chapter in which you talked about the experiences of being, um, vices, uh, civil rights, uh, what, what it, reporter, I guess. Correspondent. Yeah. Yeah. Correspondent. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, taking a, a quote from there, you say a strange but perfectly logical paradox arises by vocally supporting what he sees as black causes. The assimilating immigrant is actually acting in the role of a white liberal. This, of course, is also part of the process of becoming white. Um, one of the things that has been a challenging conversation for me to have is the relationship as an Asian person to whiteness uh, to anti-blackness or even black solidarity. And you bring up some pretty, you know, thought provoking points when we're talking about this. I think you're one of the first people who, in my opinion, courageously just puts it out there. So let's oh, talk about, <laughs> yeah, let's talk about, let's talk about that line, you know, and what you mean. Right. By that. Right. That's a great, um, I'm glad that you brought that up because it's something that I haven't been asked very much. And it was certainly one of the things that I hope that people would discuss. Uh, yeah. Um, you have at that moment of last summer, right. Um, you have like a lot of conversations amongst Asian Americans about black anti-blackness in the Asian community, right. Which is, is a problem. I think that we can admit like there's certainly anti-black uh, attitudes that are either brought over from the home country or developed here in America. Right. Or, or you can sort of say it's all American imperialism and racism and white supremacy. That's fine too. Right. Like I agree with all of that. The, what I found last summer though, was almost like a purification. And it happened because Tu Tao, who was the uh, Hmong police officer who stood beside Derek Chauvin was Asian American. Right. And that there was a lot of ways. And I think a lot of neurosis in a way to try and disassociate, Asian Americans from Tu Tao, right? And that this took 
form of this almost ritualistic thing. Like the example that I like to talk about, I think I've mentioned in the book, is that at some point there's this very well publicized push from Ivy League students who are Asian American um, to uh, write letters home about anti-blackness in their communities, right? And so you think about that and you're like, well, why are they doing this so publicly, right? Like if they want to address anti-blackness in their communities, why are they, why are they sort of making this almost ritualistic uh, offering, right? Um, and why are they identifying themselves as Ivy League students, right? Like that's the other part. It's like, who cares? You know, like, um, like, is that really like, are we really doing this sort of like weird, like kind of like model minority respectability thing? You know, like, well, we are uh, Ivy League students. Uh, and so I thought about that, that moment quite a bit, you know, and because I saw shades of it almost everywhere. And what I realized was that I think that what it is, is that it is a disassociation with the ugly people in your community that that would that would make you not feel like you're part of a multicultural coalition. Right. That would make you feel ashamed and would make others question your your place within this struggle. Right. Like, I think that's what it is. It's just like, oh, well, it, I'm one of the good ones is what they are saying. Right. And so where does that impulse, where do you hear that type of impulse the most, right? Like I'm one of the good ones. Hey, you know, it's not, my uncle is racist, but I'm not, right? That is a white liberal impulse, right? Like that is white liberal, that is the language of, of sort of like a type of white liberal ally. And I would say that for those kids and for a lot of the people who are upwardly mobile, like Ivy League students, right? That the desire is not to try and fight for one's own racial identity or to try and situate yourself within an idea that our struggles are shared under white supremacy, right? Like, I think the understanding is that I'm actually kind of fine, you know, and that, uh, that, that I actually can't enter into any sort of coalitional politics, right? Like I can't actually fight. I can't just say, Hey, you know, I, I, I also suffer under white supremacy. And so I'm going to stand next to you. Our struggles are, are, it may not be the same, but we have shared struggles. We'll fight together. I don't think that that impulse is really, common amongst Asian Americans of that type right now, right? Like, I think the much more common impulse is I will be an ally, right? Um, like, and please don't associate me with the bad ones, right? Like, I'm the good one. I'm an ally. And I think that that is a white liberal impulse. Like, so like that, that's sort of why I wrote it. I don't know. I think I'm right, you know, but I understand why it's a provocative, you know, I understand why people might have problems with that argument. I could see some others hearing that. And I mean, the thought that came into my mind was what you hear from a lot of Jewish Americans right. when there's, you know, a Jewish American or something happens to a Jew in another country where they turn out to be a criminal or something. And there very much is a concern of how does this reflect upon right. the larger community? And so, yes, it's yes, I'm not him, but also it's kind of we're sorry he's part of us at the same time. Right. It's both. Right. And, um, I don't know. I, 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 I think that, uh, I I think that people just need to, I don't know. I think it's, it's more healthy. Right. I don't know why we've gotten away from this idea that, you know, like we can have shared struggles. Right. I don't understand why things have gone to a point where if one person is suffering more than the other, that those two can't find shared struggle together. Right. And have some acknowledgement that this is true in life. Right. Um, but I find it to be totally endemic at this point. And um, I think it's I think it's bad. You know, like I, I think it I think it makes people less likely to be political. Right. I think being an ally is very different than being somebody who sees a who sees the personal stake in all of this. Right. I think denying yourself that personal stake is is basically depoliticizing yourself, right? And that, and sort of dressing yourself up to be somebody who's cheering from the sidelines. And I don't understand, honestly, why that, why that has become so, um, why that has become so ubiquitous at this point. Um, I'll go on and ask another question. Because, uh, you, you tell, a number, obviously, a number of stories in this, in this book. Um, and at the beginning of your chapter on Emirations, uh, you relate a story of how when your family traveled, your mother would look through the local phone book of the hotel for Korean names, even calling up a local number to ask if, you know, is life okay for them there? <laughs> and, and I think there are a lot of things that immigrants experience and do that are recognizable or expected by non-immigrants when they learn about them. Right. But I admit that that totally surprised me. And I, I was wondering not only about anyone who got that call, but just how they would respond um, now, and I know that story was really just kind of part of the intro to your tale about right, your right, right, drug, right, but right. could you talk a bit more about 
how you felt as a kid when that happened. I mean, was that a, a situation where you're as a kid, you're just like, mom. Right, um, right. Could, no. you, could, you, could I, you also say in there you're more like your mom than your dad was? Right. My father would mostly be horrified by at the I, I don't know if horrified is the right word. I think that's too cruel to him. I think he would mostly be like, can you not do this? Why are you calling random Korean people? Like we would be in like Billings, Montana, you know, and she would look in the phone book for Korean names in Billings, Montana, and she would just call them. <laughs> And it was, you know, now that I think of, I thought about it, you know, at the time I didn't understand it. Obviously it's just like your mom is eccentric, right? Like that's sort of the way that you think about it. But in retrospect, it's highly sympathetic to me now, right? Like she, my, uh, my parents were very, are still very outdoorsy, right? Like they, uh, we didn't do any vacations except go to national parks for many years when I was a kid, me and my sister, like we didn't go to, Hawaii or Disney world or whatever, my parents would just drag us out to like Grand Teton national park or, you know, sort of expanses in, in the West. And, um, I think this was before now, if you go to the national parks, there's tons of Asian people, you know, like a lot of like, you know, like Korean American, Chinese American people hiking all around, but back then it was pretty rare. And so like, I think that, uh, at least from my memory, right. I don't really remember. And so I think she felt very isolated in those places. Right. And that she, uh, uh, part of it was a protection thing. Like, you know, like what if, what is, would it be like if these people have not seen an Asian person in three years. Right. And so seeing the names there, I think was comforting for her. Now why she needed felt the need to go ahead and call, <laughs> call them. I don't know, you know, but um, she's a very forward person in that sort of way. Um, and so <laughs> I don't think she felt any sort of embarrassment about it, but, uh, but yeah, that was, that was sort of a, uh, you know, I, it's one of those things that your parents do when you're a kid and you're my sister and I, I think we're probably pretty horrified and and now we sort of understand it much better um so i kind of glazed over this chapter the uh the the chapter about doug john john had, had right. talked to her about doug but doug as the uh, part of the men's rights activist asians and i think i i, I glazed over that just because um you, right i know like some of the the thoughts that they have excuse me are very extreme but tell us why you decided to include, you know, the experience um, with with Doug and all these men's rights activists or I'm sorry, men's rights activist Asians. Right. Um, well. I wanted to sort of try and show like since so much of the book is about how do you be political, right? Like how do you situate yourself in politics? How do you sort of even and politics can mean anything, right? But in the end, it's just like, how do you advocate for yourself in some ways, right? How do you make people care about you and like your family? And I think that uh, I wanted to show an example of what can happen when you grow up your entire life and you feel no access to any of that, right? Where you feel like nobody cares. And I think that that is very common amongst Asian men, right? East Asian men specifically, that they feel like there's no way to enter politics at all, right? And I'm not talking about, obviously I'm not talking about electoral politics. I'm not talking about activism even, but just like, this is who I am. These are my people. And like, I, and I feel a certain amount of pride in that. Right. Like, I think it's very difficult. Um, and so I think that like some, sometimes what happens in these instances is that you become completely apolitical, right? Like you sort of suppress all of that idea and then you try and live and try and make a lot of money, something like that. Right. Like that's a very common model with, uh, Asian American men, right? Like, it's just like, I don't really want to think about this. So I'll just become rich, you know, and then I won't have to think about it. I honestly don't fault people who do that. I mean, I don't think that they, sh I think that they should be more political, but you know, like, it's just like, well, I don't know, you know, it's like not the worst outcome for you personally. Maybe it's bad for the world. Right. But like, you know, like I get why you feel that way, but for some people, you know, like they can't, they feel a great need to enter politics in some sort of way or to enter, to sort of interact with the world in this sort of way. And sometimes I can take on very radical and very sort of extreme uh, excesses, right? Sometimes it can go into places that are quite dark. And so for this chapter, I wanted to sort of show that process, right? Like with, Doug is my friend. He was, you know, like when I started writing, when he started going down this rabbit hole, he was my friend. He's still my friend now. You know, like it's not, I'm not somebody who like sort of condemns people in that sort of way. Um, but the stuff that he went through was definitely concerning to me at the time. Right. Like, I was just like, I don't know what you're doing. You know, like, like, and I had known a little bit about these groups and I was like, ah, you know, like, please, please don't. Right. But, um, 
I don't know. I, I, I tried to, I tried to write a chapter in which I do not think that things that they are doing are good. Right. Like I think that like I, I, there's no part of me that supports some of the stuff that happens in those groups. Right. And yet I wanted to try and under show people, why is it that people do this? Right. And who are the people who do this? Like, are they so radically different? Are they also like such so-called like incels, you know, like where you sort of have dehumanized somebody by, by like, uh, by saying like this person is X, Y, and Z. Right. And now it's showing that they're not really, you know, they're not actually at the core of all that much different than a lot of Asian dudes that, you know, you know, <laughs> um, they have just chosen to express this one part of being an Asian guy in America, like in this sort of frightening way. Right. And that I don't think that, 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 uh, as a writer, I feel much real need to like condemn or not condemn people. Right. Like I just feel a need to describe what is happening. And I think that that's why I was interested in it because I felt that there had been a lot written about these people and yet nobody had attempted to make an, a distinction about why they were doing this in any sort of way, other than like, you know, they're incels or like, you know, they, they hate, like, I, I just didn't find that narrative to be particularly satisfying. And so, uh, I took my shot at it. <laughs> Right. You, you've written, of course, that, you know, previous being a Marxist radical and, and kind of the various evolution right. of, of yourself to where you are today. For our audience who maybe doesn't know any of that, could you tell us a bit about that evolution and what, if anything, you retained from your various, you know, other eras in your life as you were growing up? Oh, yeah, man. I was all over the place. You know, like uh, I was uh, when I was 16 or 17, 15 to 17, I would say, you know, like I very much identified with uh, black culture in a way that I think would be very embarrassing to revisit in 2021, you know. Um, and uh, and then in college, I sort of became like a revolutionary Marxist for a couple of years. And then I got kicked out of school or I have more dropped out, I guess. Right. But, um, failed out, I think is the correct term. And then I went out and I tried to become like a Buddhist monk for a while, like, you know, like sort of meditate all the time and read the text. And um, <laughs> I'm not sure if I've returned, you know, then I was a degenerate gambler for a number of years. Right. Um, I don't know. It was, uh, I think that's why I sort of feel like I understand these guys, you know, because I think they're in some ways people who, need to feel some type of radicalism or some sort of extreme extremism to feel alive. Right. Um, and I, I do think comes from like massive suppression of self all the time. Right. Which is something that I went through as a, as a, as a kid, it's just like, who am I? I like, well, who cares? It doesn't matter. You know? And then just, you just, then you can become anything, you know, and it's like, well, I'll just spend the next, uh, I'll spend the next th two years playing poker because like, I don't, you know, it doesn't really matter, right? Like there's no self here. I can just be whatever and whatever the id sort of suggests I'll just become. Um, yeah, I don't know if I've retained anything. I'm much different now, you know? I, I sit here in my basement here in the East Bay and, uh, you know, I have a kid and, you know, I have a lot of work to do. And so it, I, I think I got it all out. <laughs> but I don't know. I guess it was good for being a writer to have experienced all those different things, right? Um, it was not good for like my bank account. It was not good for my mental health and it was not good for my health in general, but, uh, certainly, you know, I was, I was all over the place forever. <laughs> Speaking uh, of, uh, your kid, um, that, you know, inspiration as well for this book, right. And right. kind of talk to us about what you, what you were saying in the book, like how you wanted her to grow up and uh, view the world and especially as a Asian kid. Right. Um, you know, that's one of the central questions here in the book, which is just, uh, will her life reflect my, I, I said, Michelle, you're 40, right? Uh, you said that you're just turned 40. I'm so we're the same age, right? Um, I, well, sorry, well, I didn't... well, technically I'm, I'm 39, but I'm turning 40 next year. And okay. you know, yeah. right, <laughs> I'm right. kidding. Okay. Sure. Just call me 40. <laughs> There's no reason to be 39. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's true. I would say turning 40 was extremely liberating for me. I was just like, who, you know, it's like, who cares now? You know, <laughs> um, um, I, I, I do sit and I think, and I like, you know, like, will she live the same, um, will she go through the things that I went through in terms of like 
you know, in terms of race, right? Was she an identity, ethnic identity? You know, like uh, what were what will the contours of her life in America be like, right? Will she even think of herself as a minority, right? Um, if she grows up here in the Bay Area, right, uh, where there's lots of kids who are very much like her, you know, um, in a way that I certainly didn't have growing up in North Carolina, you know. So, um, and has will has have things changed in the last. 30 years since when I was 10 years old and, you know, when she'll be 10 years old. Right. Um, and that's, that's sort of the intellectual query of the book or the emotional query of the book. Like, how do I feel about that? Right. Like, let's say that she does have less of a, less of a life, uh, like I did, you know, like one of her teachers recently said like, you know, like, uh, that, you know, she hopes that the kids in the class all become allies, right? And I remember thinking, I was like, I don't know, is she an ally? You know, like, I wouldn't have thought of myself as an ally growing up in North Carolina. Like, you know, like, I, I would be like, I'm not white. Like, what are you talking about? Like, look at me, you know? Um, but is there a reality to what that teacher is saying, right? Like, is she going to be sort of relegated to that thing? And in that way, like, is that a much more privileged life than I lived? Right. And I would say, yes. Right. Like, is that a more comfortable life? Yes. We all want our kids to have to have comfortable lives. We don't want them to suffer. Right. And so then you just think, but what is she losing in that? You know, like what like what is there something that's lost? And so uh, I don't have any great answers for that. Right. I can't see in the future, but I do think that like it was important for me to state this question out front. Right. Like, um, you know, like, is she going to even identify with the stuff I write? Right. Like, uh, because like, it, will it be foreign to her? Will she be like, what's my dad talking about all this stuff? You know, um, those are just sort of questions that I had while writing the book. In your epilogue, uh, you muse about moving to Seoul in an area where your, might, your wife might feel at least the least amount of alienation as you right, put it. Right, right, right. And, <laughs> you know, and, you know, what would their lives be like? Would they, you know, would this, would they assimilate? Would they feel, you know, how would they feel? And that just kind of got me to, to wondering, and I've raised this a number of times with, with, People kind of when we're talking about American culture and failure to deal with stuff and all the mess that we do here, are there other countries that do this better? That that uh, you know handle multicultural, multiracial populations without so much of the you know, everything <laughs> that we do wrong here? How's that? Uh, That's a big I question. I don't know. I mean, I think maybe parts of Europe might be. But they also have huge problems too, right? Um, but uh, but maybe not the same. Maybe it's more. I don't know. I, I I just find it hard to. I think that that as countries become more multiracial, that there will always be growth, growing pains, right? And that um, and that I think this is just something that's probably just true, and that um. Uh, civilized and enlightened culture tries very hard to fight against those, right? Against sort of the nativist impulse. But that does, you know, while maybe also acknowledging that a certain type of nativist impulse is almost intrinsic to this project of, of creating a multiracial, multiethnic immigrant society. And so I'm not sure if anyone does it better. I know one thing, a Korea doesn't do it better, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, like, uh, I think that a lot of people are sort of awoken now to like sort of the, the population of South Asians and, you know, they watch squid game. There's a character in squid game who's like from South Asia. Right. And like his conditions are horrible. Right. Um, that is an accurate reflection of the, of the way in which South Asian people in South Korea are treated, right? And so it's not that they don't like, and Korea itself, like the reason why that population is not known about why Squid Game ends up being something people are surprised about is because they're totally a race, you know, like they're like, they're like not part of the conversation. Korea presents itself as an ethno state, right? So um, I don't know. I don't think Korea does it better. I would just say that way, but I don't, and I think that America, you know, like I, I will say that I think there's a part of me that is, um, you know, still optimistic about possibilities here for, for what's going to happen just because there's just so many different people, you know, <laughs> like the, the 1965 hard seller act really did radically change the country. If, and it's, it's strange to me that when you talk, when you, that uh, the only people who talk about it that way 
are people like Tucker Carlson, right? Um, when it's just like, hey, you know, 1965 Immigration Act has created like a replacement for us white people, you know? And I think that there's a progressive way to talk about the 1965 Immigration Act, but we don't really talk about it in that sort of way, right? Like we don't, we don't say that it did radically change the country. It did radically change the country. We should, we should discuss it in such ways, right? And that will help us plan for like uh, what the future will look like. I'll read again from your book. And uh, speaking of, you know, moving away or thinking while we're in lockdown, like what's what's next? Um, I, I liked this paragraph. But when I consider the actual impact of the pandemic on the broader Asian American community, skyrocketing unemployment and the destruction of small businesses in the restaurant, food supply and nail and beauty salon industries, I wonder which Asia America will appeal to the millions of immigrants who are facing an uncertain economic future, the identity, the identity neurosis of the wealthy or the right wing version that valorizes hard work, equal opportunity and law and order. Yeah. Let's well, talk about this. I mean, in San Francisco, you have a great example of this, right? Cause you have all the controversy around Lowell high school, right. Um, in the, and, and you have uh, the mobilization of grassroots organizers who are trying to recall the school board over this, right? Um, and um, and I see, I live in the East Bay, but I still, every time I go to San Francisco, I see these people, you know, like they're handing out flyers, right? They, they are uh, sort of campaigning, they're doing their own protests, right? And it struck me as interesting just because like, uh, I don't see that type of political energy out of the progressive side of Asian America, right? In the Bay Area, right? Like, I think that the main energy is on the right. Now, there's a lot of great organizing done on the left in Asian American spaces in the Bay Area. A lot of it has to do with like occupational work. It has to do with immigrant rights. All these things are real, right? But it's not sort of like a go out in the streets and like tear things down type of energy. It's a let's help people type of energy. I think that's wonderful. Right. Um, but I do think if you're talking about an ascendant political ide ideology that's going to be sort of affecting recent immigrants, mostly. Right. I'm not talking about like second, third generation people. I think talk about mostly like recent immigrants. I do think that sort of that this idea that, um, you know, your kid is no longer going to Lowell or something like that, which is not necessarily true. If you look at the actual enrollment numbers at Lowell this year, right? like the Asian population didn't drop that much. Um, but if you were sold this narrative that like you came here, you work very hard, you were told that this is a meritocracy, that if your kids study very hard, that they can go to this great school and then end up going to Stanford or Harvard, Yale, whatever. And now because there's too many of you that uh, that we're going to change all the rules. Right. I think that's going to be a profoundly alienating experience and a profoundly, you know, formative experience for a lot of new immigrants. And I don't think that they will choose the the progressive side and given that now, and it's very early but you know even like two days ago the new york city mayoral election right which was you know like uh between uh eric adams and a conservative curtis silva there is a big swing in in uh in asian immigrant neighborhoods towards the republican party even in that you know even in like a mayoral election that's not really contested, like the Republican just sort of runs for show, you know, like even in that type of thing, right? Like you're seeing swings. Um, now that's not all uniform, right? You see uh, in the recall election here in California, the Vietnamese population in Orange County, which uh, is generally pretty right leaning, right? Like pretty much supported Trump for the last four years. They swung very hard towards, you know, not doing the recall, right? Like sort of supporting Gavin Newsom. And so there's there's a lot of different communities who are sort of swinging all over the place. But I do think that like in general, that that the right right now um, has a much more appealing pitch to make to, make, to Asian Americans it's up to progressives. Uh, you know, and I'll just, you know, like, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone. You know, certainly I would consider myself pretty far on the left, right? I think it's up to, to progressives to make a better pitch, right? And the better pitch is not like, you know, what happened to why is Scarlett Johansson making this in this movie? Right. Like, like who cares? <laughs> you know? Especially when the other person is concerned about their kid. Right. Um, like those two don't match up in any sort of way. One is talking about like an actual thing and the other is talking about some sort of vague idea of representation. Like it's just very difficult. And so I think that the left just needs to make a better pitch. Like it, we need to have a better understanding of these people's lives because I do think they're, I do think we can convince them, you know, 
uh, I, I do think that like ideas like universal healthcare ideas, like, uh, ideas like, um, you know, child support, like, uh, support for kids, like financial support for kids, like credits for kids. Like, I think all that stuff is very appealing to recent immigrant families who are, who are generally like living in a lot of precarity. We don't make the pitch that way, right? Like we make the pitch more around like, you know, I don't know, these people won't like, we're less racist than the other side. And then, you know, somebody brings up Allison Collins or something like that. And then everything like gets blown, blown up, you know, um, Kind of underscores Rick Wilson's comment that uh, Democrats are holistically bad at politics, um, <laughs> and and somewhat one of our audience members uh, submitted a, a question kind of along these lines or with regard to the college applications, mm. and obviously the whole you know and wanting to know if you will be writing more about how Asian Americans experience the college application experience and what their experiences are once they get into college. Yeah, that's a great question. I wrote a very long article for the Times Magazine about the Harvard Affirmative Action case. And so if you haven't read that, I would check that out. So um, I spent quite a bit of time doing it, uh, looking into it. And it was actually something that informed a lot of my thinking for this book. Um, I think that, uh, you know, like that's where I started to really theorize and think about a rightward swing in Asian American communities, right? Where it's just like I saw. Um, I would, I, this was when I was in New York city, I would talk to these kids who went to these schools like Stuyvesant or Hunter or Bronx science, which are the equivalent of Lowell right here in the Bay area. And, uh, the kids were all very progressive, right? Like they're, they're, you know, some of them are like, even like, you know, like some of them are like, half of them are like socialists and the other half are like sort of very, very progressive people who would support like AOC or something like that. And then you say, and all of them are, um, all of them support affirmative action, right? All of them sort of said, yeah, I'd be willing to give up. If it came down to it, I would give up my spot at Yale or Cornell or something like that so a black student would go, right? Their parents, on the other hand, absolutely not, right? The opposite end of that spectrum. And so I started to think about it as just like, well, their parents aren't that old, right? Like these are just kids who are in high school. It's not like people who are seven, in their 60s or 70s. And then I think that there was a mass sort of political um, that those people are starting to let themselves be heard much more than, than before. It's not that they've changed their mind about this stuff. They always felt like Harvard discriminated against them, right? Now they've been given a political voice, right? Through some of these right-wing networks and through some of these right-wing legal activists. And I think that, that it is coalescing into like a political movement right now um, around college admissions. Uh, as for the college admissions themselves, I don't know. Um, you know, like my thoughts on that are much more radical and, you know, I generally involve open admissions and, you know, I think it's ridiculous that UCLA lets a 10% of its applicant class. It's a public university, like, you know, it's shameful, right? Like you shouldn't reject 90% of your students. Uh, I think it's ridiculous that Cal, um, you know, rejects 85% of their applicants. Like, what are you, what are you doing? You're a public university, you know? Um, and uh, for those public, big public university to try and act like Stanford or Harvard, I think is embarrassing. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. <laughs> um, yeah. I can't believe, uh, you know, we're almost out of time. I've really enjoyed having this discussion with you, Jay. And for everyone else who's joined us and you haven't gotten the book yet, grab a copy of The Loneliest Americans by Jay Kasman Kang. Uh, so Jay, my last question for you really touches on solidarity. I made, like I said earlier, you made me, think very, very hard as a radical progressive myself and one who has joined some of these protests, one who, you know, talks about all these concepts, but failed to tie in what we're doing here to be effective Asians as we fight for social justice. And so let me read um, my last quote from your book, and let's talk about how we build that solidarity going forward. And uh, here, this one, what does it mean to be Asian American if some of your people are using it as a stopping point on a path toward whiteness while the poorest and most vulnerable get stuck with the bill? And this resonated very closely to me as I see, you know, I'm right here in Oakland. I see the poorest of my community who are being affected and impacted by the violence and this issue being politicized. And I've not yet known how to articulate and talk about this because I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid to piss off people in my own community or my own political party right. and so forth and so on. So let's talk about, you know, solidarity and where we go, you know, going forward. How do you see it? Right. Um, that's uh, what this is. First of all, I want to say this has been uh, a great 
I mean this very sincerely. These are always questions that I wanted to talk about, and you know, it, it requires a uh, taking the book seriously. And so I thank you both for taking the book very seriously. Like you know, like I uh, feel very heartened by that. You know, um, I would say to answer your question, a lot of my thinking around this came because I was a reporter at protest for six years. Right? And so I went to dozens and dozens and dozens of protests um, around the world, really. Um, and but mostly here in the United States. Right. And mostly around Black Lives Matter. And uh, at the beginning, I saw almost no Asian people at these protests. Right. Wherever it was, Baltimore, St. Louis, um, New York City, L.A., Baton Rouge, I mean, Baton Rouge maybe it's a little more understandable because there's not so many of us there, but right, Minneapolis, right? Like I, I would see very few. Um, and uh, it always bothered me, right? Because I would say like, where are these people? You know, like, why am I the only one here? I'm a reporter, right? I'm not even like, I, like I'm, I've, I'm the only Asian person I've seen really. And, um, you know, like I, I felt, I feel, I've, I feel very strongly about the importance of protest. I feel very strongly about like the right to protest. And I think that in the streets is where a lot of these things happen, where these ideas of solidarity happen there. Um, and I remember going to a protest last summer at uh, Oscar Grant Plaza and this woman, um, Liz Suck, who is a, you know, an organizer in Oakland, who's Korean American, sort of gave the speech. And uh, she gave a speech about occupied Seoul right and occupied palestine and um and the parallels to lives of black people in america and it was profoundly uh, affecting to me you know like i had never seen an asian person at a protest talk like that in my life i've been to so many protests you know it's literally my job you know and so my thought was just that like there's no apology there right there was a deep sort of thinking about things in terms of internationally but also sort of communities that that this person helps in this in in the East Bay, which are not wealthy communities, they're not upwardly mobile communities. They're the communities that you're talking about, Michelle, right? Um, and that I think that if we can sort of think that way, where we don't apologize for ourselves so much, right? Where we center our activism in the in those communities that need no explanation for why they need help, right? Like they they need no apology. Like you don't need to apologize to help to help poor people, right? Like you don't like people will understand why you're helping poor people. Then the connections that you can make to other people, to other struggles will be much more obvious, right? Like, um, and that, that you won't, that they will be much more easy to act upon. I think that's the best way to build solidarity, right? Like that you center your lives around people who are struggling. If you look at the Cambodian population in Oakland or the East Bay, and you see the high incarceration rates and you, you work with that community and what are the natural, uh, what are the natural sort of openings that will happen for you and other communities? They'll be right there, right? Cause other communities have high incarceration rates, the communities that have high incarceration rates in black Latino communities, whatever, there will be something to sort of bridge those two. You can't bridge it. If all you're trying to do is sort of become an ally, right? Like you, you and that you sort of don't, don't do the work in your own, in your own community. And so I think that that's sort of, you know, like that's sort of my long winded answer to that, but it's basically just like, Hey, you know, like let's try and help the people that need help. And I think, you know, I have full faith that the, that the solidarity will come out of that. Right. Like, I think that our problem is that we're not trying to help the people that we're trying to help. We're trying to help ourselves, you know? And I think that that becomes obvious in a lot of ways. Um, and it makes it difficult to have that type of solidarity. Certainly people can, can learn a lot more about this and you're thinking on this in your, in your book, but I just wanted to turn just for a second, because in addition to being a writer, you're a podcaster. Right. It's time to say goodbye. <laughs> Tell us about the podcast, what, what its goal is. Do you, do, what do you find it effective to do? Oh man, uh, that's a good question. So I started with two of my friends, Tammy and Andy, and we started at the beginning of the pandemic. And the reason why I started it was because Tammy had been doing a lot of reporting about Korea's response to the pandemic. Right. And Andy was a historian of China. And I thought that like, we could do this podcast that was like sort of about the pandemic and we we could talk about Chinese history and sort of a lot about China. We could also talk about like sort of Korea, which had been very popularized at that point, almost fetishized. It's like, do you remember this period where everyone's like, 
Korea is doing all this testing, right? Which is true, right? It deserves a ton of credit for that. But we wanted to contextualize it a little bit more, right? Like, why was Korea so good at this? Well, it's because of like MERS, right? Like they had a pandemic before and they basically like wrote a Patriot Act bill against like the pandemic where you, if there's like a hint of a pandemic, you have no more civil liberties, you know? Like they can look in your phone, they can track you wherever. Now that is an amazing pandemic uh prevention tool, but it should be said that that's why they're effective about it. Right. So we, um, we, we sort of went around and we thought that that would be a good podcast. Also, we were all living in a, you know, we couldn't, it was the height of the pandemic. So we couldn't leave our houses. Like it was still the time when I would like go to say, uh, the grocery store, I'd go to Safeway and I'd bring all the stuff back. And then I would like bleach wipe all of it. So just like the most, I don't know if you remember, it's like the most miserable time of my life. <laughs> you know, I was just like sitting on the porch, you know, like rubbing down like cucumbers and bleach. Just really, oh my God. Or like rubbing down, uh, you know, like bags of chips with, uh, with bleach wipes. So you're like, what is happening? Um, and so it came out of that moment of like, you know, sort of, like a mix of like boredom and fear, right? More fear than boredom. I don't know if boredom is actually the right word, but like having nothing to do except freak out. Um, and since then, like we didn't really expect very much of it, but we got a, you know, we have a pretty solid audience. And then um, it, we've turned it into a space for people who are on the left. Um, many, many who have, you know, like many of whom are Asian American, many of whom are not. And we have like an online community. We do meetups, we do stuff like that. And, um, uh, we, you know, there's organizing that happens, like people share things, like actions that they're going to. And so, um, yeah, it's an attempt at community building at this point. And, you know, it's something I, I care about very deeply, you know, um, and, and uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, and it's been the most satisfying thing that I've done over the past five years in terms of like uh, building this thing and, and, you know, seeing that it is important to people. Like, it's been great. Jay, I want to thank you so much for spending your hour with us. It's been enjoyable. And again, I love the book. I mean, again, I can't say that I was like agreeing with everything, but I learned <laughs> a lot. And uh, it, you also made me think. So if you're out there and you want to learn something and you want to think outside of what you know, grab a copy of The Loneliest Americans by Jay Caspian Kang. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And again, Jay, come back anytime oh no thank you michelle and john this is like that you know this is really uh i don't know my heart is full like what a wonderful conversation thank you so much and thank you for uh you know really thinking about things and the questions asked are so incisive and you know it, like it, you know it's important for me to be able to answer them and um you know like it was it was great so i, I love the format and thank you so much i'll come anytime you want me i'll be on john back to you well, great. Well, we look forward to having you in person at our building on, uh, in San Francisco when uh, that's right. a little bit easier to do. Uh, thanks again to our special guest on this Michelle Miao show at the Commonwealth Club of California. And last but not least, thanks to all of you for watching and listening to this program. You can find more programs at commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. <laughs>